Next up, we have an uh, international speaker. He is founder at TM Site and the leading expert on software as a service and its pricing. So, next, I would like to welcome on stage Sagi Gulianka, who, who will present uh, successful SaaS pricing models. Sagi, please. Applause, please. White light. So, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sagi Gulianka, and I'm a pricing specialist. And this is how I present myself. So 18 is the number of years that I've been doing pricing. 360 is a methodology. I've been working for large companies for a long time, so helping them with their pricing, taking the additional 1% or 2% in order to squeeze many, many million more. And at some point of my career, I thought, what would be a good way to take those methods and scale it down to startups and help startups with one of their most important and biggest decisions during launch, which is pricing, what kind of model, how to price it. Most startups will not have any room for mistake, not enough time and not enough money to make mistakes and correct that, like uh, bigger companies. And passion, this is what I love to do. I love every aspect of my job, from modeling to behavioral, um, to everything, to the human interaction, to the human psychology, everything that is connected to pricing. So today we're going to talk about value, because value is the main thing. If I don't understand the value, I cannot put a price on any, pr on any product or service. So value is extremely important. Uh, we're going to talk about the more uh, exotic part of pricing, which is behavioral economics, all the psychology part that could help you a lot. And at the end, we will see the iPad launch as an example. The reason I showed the iPad launch is because uh, this was so significant in applying behavioral economics method into pricing. So Apple was one of the first companies that actually did that. So it would be interesting to see the history that many SaaS companies later followed. So I know it's noon, but you're going to work with me today. So here's a question for you. Which yogurt bowl would you choose? So everyone that would like the right one, please raise your hands. OK. So there is a reason to that. And I have saw quite, quite a lot of hands. So you can clearly see this is the same bowl. But there is something special about the right one. And no, the spoon is not included. So same product. But this one is ready to be eaten. So. How many of you that raise your hands are actually right-handed? So there was a research that was showing that if you want people to buy a certain product, it should be presented in a very attractive way. So right people chose this one in a much higher rate than left, than left people. So. Each and every detail is important because at the end, it affects the value of your product, the acceptance of your customers, and in a way, it helps me later on put the correct price. So the one with the spoon could have gotten a different price than the one without the spoon. And this is the value framework. Again, we cannot go deep into that, but at least uh, you understand what we are trying to achieve. So first thing, we want to add value. This is the way, the value that your product or service generate. The second thing, you want to communicate that value. So what's the message behind it? Are you reaching your customer with the right message? And the third part is put a price on a value. On the customer side, so you need to drive the value. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. If you don't, you need to take a good look into your product or service. You need 
to make sure that the value is perceived in the right way. So sometimes it happens, sometimes the value is good, but the message is just not good enough. And of course, you need to understand that price perception also working uh, for you. So for instance, I've been working for a company in which they sold the product, but the price perception was few times more than the actual price. So basically, they just didn't communicate, pricing was too complex, and because of that, people didn't buy the product. So the challenge was to change the price perception. So, some companies fail in adding value and communicating the value. What would be the next step for them? Drop the price, which would be a, a, just a big mistake, destroying value. Um, if the problem is the add value, you should go to the adding value. If the problem is communicating the value, you should communicate it better. Only if the problem is in price, then drop the price. So for me as a pricing specialist, I always look on all these parts before I make any changes in the pricing. So there are different types of values. Um, it could be very strict, easy to measure, like saving, like increasing income, uh, things like that. Or it could be very, very soft. Um, like perceptions, like emotions, like preferences. So easy to measure, could be measured, but not that easy in some methods of market research. And normally you would see that separation, but that's not like a strict separation. So it's more common to find um, like clear values within the businesses and more soft values uh, within the consumers. So for startups, this is probably not a good way to start your startup. So basically, you build a product, you think you have a good idea, and then you find out hmm, what would be the cost of that product, the direct cost and all the co related cost. And once you understand that costing issue, then you could add a few percent on top of that, how much you want to, and create the price. And then, hopefully, it will meet the market. So hopefully, the customer will perceive the value the same way as you priced it, and, and the customer would buy it. But taking this method means you didn't take the customers into consideration, only your costs. So that's, that's and value-based pricing is completely the opposite. So you go to the market, this is actually a pricing methodology, but if you think about it, this is, this is a good way to, to open your startups, to think about your startups. So you have an idea, but first you go to customers. You have no product. You go to your customers, you speak with your customers, you let them uh, know your idea and see what their opinion is. You understand the value that you generate, and then you can determine the price. No product yet. You can determine the price, and then you should be very creative to have the lowest cost possible to support your price. If that's possible, great, you have a business. If not, move on to the next one. So cost plus would be rarely relevant for, uh, for such companies, of course. So I'm going to show you IKEA. And IKEA, I think, is, is probably one of the best companies in the world in doing value-based pricing. Now, this guy is probably an engineer, and I'll, later I'll show you why. I, the most creative people in IKEA probably are the engineers and not the marketing guy. Sounds counterintuitive, but let's see. So this is how IKEA presented. They always design the price tag before everything else. And they know exactly what would be the price to serve mass of customers. I was talking with the former, um, with the former uh, um, CEO of IKEA, the first one that opened the IKEA in Israel. And he never got, at the beginning, he never got, he got like 7,000 products, never got the costs. He had to go and find what would be the best price to sell that in the market. Only then, 
he realized what was the cost. So some products, the cost was very cheap, but could have been sold in a relatively high price. And some products just could not be supported in the market because the market was not willing to pay even the cost of the product. So this is what they do after they set the price. They tell the engineers, this is your cost target. Go get it. And this is just an example of making a table. And the base of the table, they used a card company because the machine was already there. So they ha only had to do some slight change. And they have like a cheaper table that still look, uh, look greatly designed. So. I was talking about the value framework, and now I'm going to talk about the pricing framework. So basically, three parts to pricing. One is price setting, setting your prices, your pricing model, your business model, your pricing points, uh, uh, later on updating your pricing. The second one is price execution. Who offer what and when? So this is more common to big companies, because you have many salespeople and you need control, you can have the best price list, but if your salespeople just don't offer the right price to the right customer at the right time, you'll have big, big problems. I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, it's less, probably less relevant for smaller companies that are uh, presented here. And the last one, which is more, a bit more exotic and I guess more fun, which I'm going to focus on that part, is the price communication. This is where you can have really quick wins about pricing, about price presentation. This is where you could change, you can A-B test your pricing, you, you could do a lot to just have better conversion rates or better prices. So I never start this part, the communication, without presenting uh, Daniel Kahneman. He's probably the father of this field. Uh, he received Nobel Prize for economics, but he never learned economics. He's actually a psychologist. So he was, all, he was always interested in just testing and finding how people react to different situations. And this is what he got his Nobel Prize for, prospect theory. So basically, he was saying something which I guess all of us could actually feel it in a very natural way. So if you gain something, you get pleasure. If you lose something, it's painful. Do you think it's worth Nobel Prize? Well, it is. Because now we can see um, the refined things. So, for instance, the reference point can change. If you just gain 100 euro and lost it after one minute, do you think you are in the same situation like if, as if you never found those 100 euros? I don't know if anyone ever played online poker, but you may end the day breaking even. If you lost first and then broke even, feels good. The other way feel, doesn't feel that good. So, losing is much more painful than winning. And you can see that it's, it's, it's just, I mean, we hate to, we hate to lose. I, I mean, we, it's okay to win, but we really hate to lose. So, um, this is why people are postponing losses. This is like a very natural way to behave. And the last thing is diminishing marginal pleasure or pain. So I don't know if there is, there is a joke saying money doesn't make people happier because there was a research and it showed that people that had only nine million dollars were not happier than people that had eight million euros. So, but that's the diminishing one. So here is a way to actually apply. So I'm going to show you methods, but also applications from real life. So in this case, this is a credit card company, and instead of telling you that if you get a certain amount of credit, you would get some present or some money back, they are telling them, okay, this is the money and it's already in your bank account. Now it's yours to lose. 
And of course, the reaction was much, much better. I mean, I've, I've used the same method, for instance, for telecom, for prepaid customers. And there is a way of telling you will get 100 or 50 euros credit if you stay with us. And instead of saying, and instead we actually said, you already got, you already got those 50 euros. Now, you can leave if you want to, but maybe you can stay a little bit more to spend it. And of course, it was very, very effective. So, here is an experiment uh, that really assisted to identify this theory. So, I will ask you a question. I will, ask you, I will actually ask you quite a lot of questions. So, just think for yourself. Be honest with yourself. There is no right or wrong here. Just your, your selection. So, here is decision A. You can earn now $1,000 or Euro, or you can take a chance of 25% to earn $10,000. So, who chooses one? That's, by the way, um, I will tell you that later. Let, let's, let's go to the second one. So, decision B, you can lose right now $5,000 or you can take a chance of 75% to lose $10,000. So, for decision B, who choose one? So, most people would choose to earn $1,000 and to take a chance of 75% not to lose because of that hate. But I realized that I'm in a startup venue, so this is a place where people are actually taking big risks. So it always happens to me when I'm on startups, um, when I speak to a crowd like you. So I love it. Okay, so let's talk about some additional principle and example. This is to build the iPad, um, the iPad example. So I want to show you some of the principles and the applications. So another one. So framing effect. Framing is about the message. So the way you construct the message can really influence uh, how customers select and perceive your product and services. So here are your options. You can save 200 people's lives, or you can have a chance of 33% of saving all 600. So, which one would you select A? Come on, guys, wake up. So, here is a, a second question. Now, you can select option C, in which 400 people die, or take a 30 feet chance that no one will die. So, who select C? Anyone noticed something about those two questions? Did you hear this guy? Can you say it out loud? They are the same. Okay, so scenario one is, and two are exactly the same, but just presented in a completely opposite way. So this was, of course, a real experiment. And for scenario A, you can see that 72% actually chose, uh, for, I'm sorry, for scenario one, you can see that 72% chose uh, option A. And for scenario two, quite the opposite. So that's how strong, and I know this is like a, an extreme example, but you can see those kind of examples all the time. The accuracy of the message is so important, and this is something you need to understand, and something you need to test, and something you need to play with, because it's very, very difficult to get it completely correctly from uh, just, just from the start. So, what do you think about those two products? They are the same, of course, at the same price. Which one do you think would sell better? The right one. Uh, I'm sorry? Okay, the right one. What do you think about this 
amazing special offer. <laughs> so that's a mistake, of course, but we are so used to get the signals and not necessarily the prices. So there is a, a famous story about Amazon, about a big promotion, big advertising, but at the end, the discount was not given. But of course, sales boosted. People didn't notice that the price was actually the same one. So the principle is to keep it simple. Free, 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 but you never know which one you should choose because there are too many options. So one of the key principles in presenting pricing and actually setting pricing is to find a simple way to capture the value that you're presenting. So, of course, sometimes you need to make it a bit more complex to capture more value, but you always need to balance that simplicity with capturing more, um, with capturing more value. Because sometimes just one price point is just not efficient. So better to have several packages. Question how many? So this is, this is just an example that it personally changed my career. It happened like 10 years ago. And we would just experiment. I thought I was an excellent pricing specialist, but I didn't pay enough attention to the way prices are presented. I was really good in setting prices, creating models, and things like that. So first of all, yeah, it looks a bit old, uh, this ad. Very complex, so it's not simple. And what we did, we kind of tested three different options. So first one was, again, very simple a message, free phone plus 20% discount. The second one was just free phone, and the third one, wa the third one was 20% discounts on calls. So look at, the, um, look at the top and just which one you think uh, was converting the best. You can shout. Yeah. This one. Any other ideas? Left one or mi middle one? Who think the left? Okay. So here are the results. Now, if you look, you need it to be simple and reliable. Okay, think about those two words. This is the clue of what was converting the best. So this got, I mean, that this, these are not real numbers, of course, just, just to give you the relative ratio between these options. So 100 clicks, 160 clicks. By the way, the purchasing later was pretty much similar, so the conversion at the end was, was not different between those options. 200 clicks. So the reason is, it looks simple, but it's too complex compared to the other options. So don't underestimate what is simple enough for your customer to understand, because it takes like one, two seconds for them to leave if they don't feel correctly, if they don't understand, if they don't see something they can relate like in a few seconds. The second one is simple, but not as reliable, because people are would not believe, OK, yeah, free, yeah, of course, let, let's move on. But it was still better than a slightly more complex message. And the last one, which basically gave something which is not as attractive as free phone, just got better conversion. Just simple message and something which people for, felt it was reliable. So for me, it changed the game because I really understood that now I need to investigate the way pricing should be presented and not just the way pricing uh, should be set. So always think simple, simple, simple. If you try to complex something, make sure the value of that complexity justifies compromising the simplicity. So this is an example of HubSpot, a company, a very successful company, a company which I love a lot. And this was the old version of their pricing. And I guess, again, I, 
I was always looking at that and I said, they could make it much more simpler for their customers. But they were still successful, and it doesn't mean they could not be more successful, again, having better conversions. So I know that many of their sales required a hands-on touch, calls, and so they had to explain things to their customers and a lot of things that were related to the pricing, which is, again, it costs money, it takes time, they lost some of the customers, and then they made a change, and this is the latest version. So now it looks compact. You can relate, you can understand where, where you need to be. So next question would be, hmm, how could they squeeze that complex structure into that much simpler structure without losing value? Because if you lose some price point, then it means you could earn less money. So this is not something you would like to do in a mature company. So what they did is, just hid the complexity, not hid, but just made it easy, made it fun to, uh, to change because now you can type anything and you could see how much you're going to spend immediately. So they took all these complex parts, they made part of it simple and the, that complexity, they just made it fun to use and very easy to use. So complexity there is just a second step. You don't want to frighten your potential customer just from the bat. Okay, ho, ho, I, I, I don't understand where should I belong here. So I need to show, I guess, Dropbox because they are the master of simplicity and just, just amazing how simple, ca how simple can achieve so much. In this case, you can already see that the early, of course, appear first, but you don't have to think. It's so easy for you to understand where, where you belong. So, I'm going to talk now, after I showed you a few examples about, about the compromise effect. So basically you have options B and C that you can select between those two. And just by adding an option A that is in a way kind of make option C to be in the middle of that will cause more people to select option C. That's the compromise effect. Yeah, we wouldn't buy the most expensive one. We, we wouldn't buy necessarily the cheapest one. A lot of people actually opting for that middle option. So this is a hamburger example. So if you sell one and a double, Adding a triple, I don't know who can eat a triple one, but uh, adding a triple just, just as a, a kind of a decoy pricing to make the double one sell better is a good option. So they would have made more money even if they wouldn't sell any of the uh, free euro options. So here is another example. This is uh, the crazy egg example. And it looks kind of a classic structure for SaaS companies. So you can see three options. They highlight the middle option as the most popular. Now I can tell you that in most cases, that's not true. In most cases, the initial one is the most popular, but they still want to attract some people to choose that. But it's rarely, you always see those entry points which people enter the, uh, the basic one and only, and you have like a mass of people there and only few of them would then uh, uh, up upgrade. So in a way it's simple, but the price points are not actually uh, balanced here. So I can tell you, and this is also like a, a rule of thumb, Normally when the pricing looks quite linear, it rarely supports the actual customer base. And if you have a look, you can see 9, you can see 49, and then you can see 99. So the differences between the pricing points is always the same. Normally you would expect lower differences at the beginning and much higher differences at, at the end. So, but that was the old one. 
So basically, they did two things. One was, okay, if that was not simple enough for you guys, if you stayed enough time, like one minute on their pricing page, there would be a pop-up, and now they would show you a simpler version just to make sure that you understand and you didn't miss anything and you're not too confused about, about the pricing. So it's always about trying to make it simpler for the customers. So this is one direction which was not that successful. Because this is what happened later on. A fourth option appeared. So first of all, what I'm trying to convey here, you may, you may find and see like a common way of doing things. But at the end, it's just a matter of your own business, your own details, in order to really understand what's correct for you. So in a way, the list is just like a good way, um, it's a good way of, um, in a way, good way of, um, as a starting point for you guys. But you should always test things and you should always find the things that are appropriate to your business. And once it's done, then, then you understand. So in this case, and I'm, I know exactly because I've analyzed some of my customers and they face the same problem, something was missing here and that's the standard option. And you can see now that in terms of pricing this is much more balanced because now they have another option um, in between the basic and the plus. So in terms of customers, this is, this is how uh, such a curve would look like. So basically they had, I don't know if you saw that, so the main value driver here was visits per month. So just pay attention to, the, to those numbers, 10,000, 25, 100,000, and 250,000. So here it is. So the basic covers from the beginning up to 10,000. And normally you would see much uh, uh, fewer customers that are spending more. Again, that's a very, very natural usage behavior that you would find. Many small customers, but not as many uh, large customers. So here's the opportunity. What you can already see, that 10,000, that was the point of the value driver. That was the point of, of the first package. You could see kind of a wall structure. So people are gathering there, but they are hesitating to move to the next package. So what happens here is that their own value driver kind of limits their customer uh, ability to consume in the way they really want to consume the product. And, and many of them were just hesitating to upgrade. OK, so this is the untapped demand here. Some people could use 15 or 25, but they didn't. So this is why they introduced the standard, because now they can tap into that demand. And normally what would happen later on is this. So the curve now would be much smoother, and some of the people would move uh, to the 19, and they would consume more. Yes, there is a risk of cannibalization of some of the customers that were on the, plus, uh, on the plus one that might now downgrade to the standard because they were not actually, maybe they spent 25 and some of them probably opted for the plus. But since that in most cases, most of the user would be there, meaning on the basic, then this cannibalization would not ruin your extra profit. So always pay attention, I, and I guess, I, I guess that, again, for many startups, you know, you, you start building your product, you launch, and in, I've seen that too, in too many cases that startups didn't build their own KPIs, their own measurements to understand what's exactly happening, why people are not buying, why people are not upgrading. So it's easy to do that, when you develop your product, because that's, that's basic analytics. It's much more difficult after you launch your product, you're busy with marketing, you're busy with sales, and then nothing happens. 
and then you have like a black box. You don't have enough information to actually understand what's happening. Is my pricing okay? Do I need to change anything? So I think probably best advice I can give you, just measure, 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 and measure from the beginning. Never treat it as a black box because this is what helps, I mean, pricing specialists to just, just to, co to correct the price. It's never, you know, it's never, you're not going to get the exactly correct price from the beginning. You will have to update that, but you want to do that in a scientific way and not just guessing your way towards the correct price. So, just an example I, I, that I was involved, very similar to this one, just a very simple mailing uh, to those potential customers and conversion was, was exceptionally good. People ju was just waiting for this kind of an offer. So, this is another effect that I'm going to talk about. And in this experiment, people were asked to state how much they are willing to pay for a product. But just before they wrote those numbers, they were asked to put to write the two last digits of the social security number or identity number. And what you can see is those are the people with the lower two digits. Those are the people with the higher two digits. And amazingly, the people with the higher two digits actually were willing to pay more. So, sounds like kind of a bug in our brain or something like that, but that's the way anchoring works. So, if we put the right number in your head, especially for products that you not normally buy or used to know the pricing, then it's very fluid. So, if you launch a new product. In many cases, you guys, startups, you don't have any direct competition. And in many cases, I've seen too many startups that's actually trying to sell themselves a bit short. So think big, think based on value. If you create significant value, you should be pricing that way. You should be say those high numbers because then you will be able to get higher prices. So customer have no idea how much they're willing to pay for new products, they have no ID. And Anchor might be a bit irrelevant. Again, when I, when I go to my local deli and I, I'm on the line and I have like a number for the line, that number is never 19. It's always 786. And the reason, they just want me to buy more because now I'm exposed to that higher number. So this is an example, um, Wix, uh, which, first of all, I love this company. The reason is that I know they are doing lots of testing. So when you see their prices, you know it has been tested quite significantly. So anchoring works in two different ways here. First of all, Wix is a freemium product. Can you see the free option here? Well, it's not here. It's in a different page. Because they realized when you put the free option together with the premium option, conversion was just not as good. People that were anchoring in their mind to free and so the other prices were less uh, tempting to later on actually upgrading to a paid version. So this is why the free is not there anymore, although the freemium model is still the model that Wix uses. So this is one anchoring effect. The second anchoring effect, if you can see the prices are presented right to left, which is a bit counterintuitive because at least until a few months ago, one year ago, most prices were presented left to right. But if you can test it and find that it's more effective, then this is, this is what happens. Uh, and the reason it happens is that most English speakers would first look at a higher pricing point because their eye is very trained to go to read uh, left to right and not right to left. And once they anchor themselves to the higher price, they will be willing to pay the lower price. And it's just better than 
anchoring uh, to the right uh, to the right side. So freeze is not here. Now, one slide about freemium. I, I guess I cannot speak about pricing without just just mentioning freemium because freemium is so uh, is so debatable because. You know, it's a good model. Some companies have seen huge success, but nowadays uh, many talk about the Dropbox effect. So many follow Dropbox in adopting freemium without considering some of the facts that could hinder their success. So there are much, much, much more failures than successes in freemium. Um, so first of all, it's, it's, it's also a matter of definition. Um, so freemium normally provides some good value for free. Um, so what's good value? It's something you could do, you know, your initial needs are, are actually met with that free option. And this, is, this is goes with Gmail, Dropbox, LinkedIn. Most guys would not need uh, to actually upgrade. It requires significant amount of traffic because conversions are quite low. I mean, you can have, like, best conversion I've seen from free to paid is like 7%. Most would struggle to gain 1 or 2%. So it requires huge amount of traffic. Can you bring that amount of traffic? Do your target audience is just big enough? Because sometimes I've seen companies that actually opting for free, but their market is just not big enough. So when you make those conversion calculation, you understand that they have no chance. And it takes time. So for instance, Wix. Wix is a company that made freemium very successful. They, they succeed with this model, but Wix raised tens of millions of dollars. So they had lots of dollars and lots of time to make freemium work. It didn't work from the beginning. I don't know how many companies today can manage to raise those kinds of, of money, this kind of money, and actually have the time to learn. Because you never start with optimal. It takes time to learn. And so just to be clear, um, I know some B2B companies use freemium model. But for me, it's not like a pure freemium model because some of them would give very, very limited uh, value for the free version. It's more of hooking. So just to give you an example, I've been working with, with SDK companies. SDK is, is just like a, a program that if you develop apps, you could, you could use that. So they want customers to use their SDK because replacing this would be very difficult. So it's very sticky. They want them to start for free, but then they limit. So if you start doing any business, you're getting many users, you immediately start to pay. You cannot use the free version just to make your initial business. You will have to pay very quickly. Freemium is hard labor. So if you don't have the right set of mind, the right organization to optimize the funnel always, all the time, all the time, then it's, it's failure waiting to happen. So it's a question of, of the entrepreneurs. It's a question of the team. Is that team geared? I've seen teams that are just not geared to do that daily hard work of optimizing each and every day. I mean, you need to get the right infrastructure, the right people. Sometimes the programmers, if they made a change, they could see that their change actually um, gained or, or had a better conversion for the company. So it's like the entire company is geared towards optimizing uh, in freemium. And it's very important to understand that your additional dollar is still effective because sometimes you find that you kind of, um, you're, not, you're not being as effective as you were in the market and then that's time, if you had this kind of curves, that's, that's the time to move to additional market because that extra dollar now, that extra marketing dollar would be more effective if you, if you move ahead. So this is how it began. Uh, Apple, and this is the first iPad presentation. 
And the first iPad presentation was special because it was a new product, new category. Apple had already some reputation of not getting the pricing correctly. It happened, um, um, it happened with the iPhone. So they, when they launched the iPhone, it was a bit too expensive. They had to knock down $200 and then compensate some customers. So, but this time, they got it really good. Sound? What should we price it at? Okay. Well, if you listen to the pundits, we're going to price it at under a thousand dollars, which is code for nine ninety nine. When we set out to develop the iPad, we not only had very ambitious technical goals anchoring and user interface goals but we had a very aggressive price goal because we want to put this in the hands of lots of people and just like we were able to meet or exceed our technical goals we have met our cost goals and I am thrilled to announce to you that the iPad pricing starts not at $999, but at just $499. I think the guy was a real genius. I, I didn't do the pricing, but... So, if you paid attention, few things happened here. First of all, don't underestimate the power of an Apple launch because this is the tweeting. This is actually not the picture from the first launch. This is the picture from the third launch. But whenever the price is announced, this is the place and this is the time where tweets actually bursted. So it happens, again, you can see two, two peaks for that. So completely powerful. So this is the model they selected. They selected three tiers. Very f anyone that does SaaS pricing looks very, very familiar. Okay, so which one you think is selling the best? Apple doesn't publish, actually, details. Just shout if you think. So, Normally, from the little information I could gather, the middle one, the 32, would sell best. If you remember the compromise effect, one is too cheap. Um, I'm sorry, one is just 16 megabytes, gigabytes, it's not enough. One is too expensive, so 32 is, uh, is kind of the middle ground. And that's the one that normally misses first from, uh, from the stores. So, initial anchor was 1999. That's the way Apple presented it. So, they, it didn't say, listen guys, we really tried hard to make it $300, but it was a tad a bit expensive and then we had to raise the price. No, he put the anchor high and then 499 looks very, very cheap. So, anything below that looks cheap because that was the first announcement of that product. He needed to use that anchoring effect to make people think they're getting a good bargain for their money. Now, nobody knew how much they were willing to pay for that product. That was a completely new product. So, they just decided for everyone. The lower price is always used to get a better price perception. So, starting at that's a good message, and this is the message that Apple also used. I don't think they want to sell too much of this 16 gigabyte Wi-Fi, but they got um, reduced functionality, those re this reduced functionality enough to have a very special pricing point, which is the 500 pricing point. So that point feels, again, a lot cheaper. And compromise effect, so 32 
is probably the sweet point. This is, this is the one that sells the most. And simple. How easy it is to understand their pricing model? How easy it is to select? No, no barrier. Just, just simplicity. And again, they were kind of the first that realized and applied those behavioral economics principles into their pricing. So that's it. Uh, that's me. Feel free to connect in LinkedIn. Feel free to approach me. I'll be happy to take some questions.